Gentlemen, we gather today, not to revel in the echoes of our past compositions, but to scrutinize a silence that challenges the very foundation of music. John Cage's 433, a piece where not a single note is played, yet it's brimming with sounds unintended by the performer. Let's explore this enigma, shall we? Intriguing, though I must confess, the concept of music composed solely of silence is as baffling as it is revolutionary. In my day, silence served the music like breaths between phrases, giving life and movement. Yet this, this is silence as the entirety, peculiar. Revolution, you say? Bah! Music dwells in the soul, and its voice is not always in the notes, but between them. Cage simply dares what we have hinted at with pauses and rests. Silence, after all, can shout louder than the fiercest fortissimo when wielded with purpose. A composition of silence. This strays from the path of what we've known as music. In my compositions, every rest, every break is meticulously crafted to serve the divine order and structure. Can silence alone truly elevate the soul as music does? There is poetry in silence, and Cage's work whispers of uncharted realms within music. As in my nocturnes, where the pauses are as profound as the notes, there is an intangible beauty in the unplayed. Yet, to consider it the entirety, it is a melancholic notion indeed. Silence in music is like the canvas to a painting, but to present the canvas alone and call it art? Preposterous. Music is emotion, drama, life. How can mere silence convey this? Cage's experiment, it edges on the absurd. But isn't music, the art of sound and silence, equally? Cage challenges our preconceptions, urging us to listen to the world anew. In the absence of intentional sound, we're confronted with the involuntary orchestra of existence itself. It's not about the absence of music, but a different presence of it. Yet imagine the audience anticipation, twisted not by melody, but by the lack thereof. It's a bold jest, toying with expectation, but does it linger in the mind as a symphony does? Silence forces the listener to internalize, to confront the sounds within. It's not jest, it's a mirror reflecting our inner tumult. Perhaps in this silence we find the true essence of music, unbounded by the limits of composed sound. Reflecting tumult, yes, but where does it lead? Music's domain is order, harmony, the reflection of celestial movements. Cage's silence seems to abandon these principles, leaving us adrift in chaos without a guiding compositional hand. And yet, there is something profoundly intimate about confronting the silence, about hearing the faintest rustles of life as music. It's as if Cage is suggesting that music is not only created, but discovered. A disquieting thought for a composer, indeed. To discover music in the mundane, the sounds of life we overlook, perhaps there is merit. But to elevate it to the realm of art without the hand of the composer shaping it, this is where I find resistance. Music is crafted. It doesn't simply exist in the ether. And so our discourse begins, not with a harmonious chord, but with a striking silence that provokes, challenges, and divides. Cage's 4 through 33 is not merely the absence of sound, but a canvas inviting us to paint with our thoughts, our discomforts, our philosophies. The dialogue it initiates may well be its most profound composition. Let us delve deeper. Silence, in its vast emptiness, conceals profound musicality. John Cage's 433 thrusts this notion into the limelight, urging us to reconsider the role of silence in music. Let us unearth the roots of this silent evolution. Wolfgang, your operas and symphonies danced with silence. Share your wisdom. Indeed, Igor, in the cradle of the classical era, silence was the shadow to sound's light. In Don Giovanni, the pauses between notes are not merely absences of sound, they are laden with expectation, with tension. It is in these voids that the music truly speaks, whispering secrets too profound for any melody to articulate. Ah, Wolfgang, you flirt with silence, yet you do not grasp its true dominion. In my late quartets, rests are not merely dramatic devices, but entities that confront the soul. As I ventured deeper into my own silence, brought on by deafness, I found that it was within the void that music's true essence could emerge. Silence thus is not just an absence, but a presence, powerful and profound. Both of you gaze upon silence as if it were a novelty. In the Baroque, the architecture of music was built as much on silence as on sound. Each rest, each gap, is meticulously calculated to elevate the spirit, reflecting our yearnings for the divine. 
Silence is the canvas upon which the notes find their meaning. Your perspectives are all entangled in your era's philosophy. In the Romantic era, silence was not merely structural or spiritual. It was the heartbeat of expression. Each pause in my nocturnes breathes life into the next note, each rest a sigh of longing. Silence, thus, is the vessel for the unspoken, the bearer of the tremors of the heart. Silence in opera, my friends, is the sharp knife that carves the space for emotion to explode. In La Traviata, the momentary quiet before Violetta's arias opens a chasm of anticipation, making her voice all the more piercing as it breaches the silence. Music and silence coexist as lovers, entwined in an eternal dance where one cannot prevail without the other. The tapestry of silence is indeed woven with diverse threads, each of you casting it in light unique to your epoch and ethos. Yet, it remains ever-present, unchanging and immutable, as essential to music as the notes themselves. Cage's 433 does not invent, but rather unveils the silent music that has always been, echoing through the corridors of time from your compositions to today. Today we delve into the conceptual boundaries between music and ambient sound. Cage's 433 remains a pinnacle of debate. Where does music end and mere sound begin? Giuseppe, your thoughts. In the grand opus of the opera, every note, every silence serves to advance the narrative. Yet Cage dares to present silence alone, challenging us to discern its musicality. But where is the emotion, the drama, inherent in silence? This perplexes me. Music, to my mind, must weave a story, stir the soul, not merely present an absence. Ah, but Giuseppe, you're clinging to tradition. Music lies not only in sound, but in the space between sounds. My late quartets, dense with emotion, exploit silence to speak as loudly as notes. Be it in the dramatic pauses of my fifth symphony, or the contemplative rests in my late piano sonatas, silence shapes the musical narrative as much as any note. Cage's silence is indeed music. It's the listener's heart that completes the composition. The premise that music and ambient sound are separable is fundamentally flawed. In my fugues, the silence between entries and the space around the counterpoint are as meticulously composed as the notes themselves. This boundary Cage suggests, it exists not in the scripture of music, but in our perception. Silence and sound, both are tools of the divine, each with a role in the greater harmony. Yet, cannot one argue that music in its purest form is emotion made audible? 433 forces us to confront what we miss in the racket of life, a reflection perhaps, but devoid of the direct emotional expression found in a nocturne or a polonaise. Silence, though poignant, lacks the color of a melancholic minor or the passion of a soaring melody. Frederick raises an interesting point. My forays into unconventional sounds were never an abandonment of the emotional undercurrents of music, but an exploration of how far these boundaries can be stretched. With 433, Cage is indeed asking, demanding even, that we reconsider the essence of music. Is not the sound of the world around us a composition of the highest order, conducted by chance? I must interject. Music is structured, ordered. It is harmony and melody and rhythm. To equate the random cacophony of life with the divine art of composition is folly. What next shall we consider the clatter of a carriage on cobblestones a symphony, the scribble of a quill on parchment an aria? There is genius in structure, in the deliberate crafting of sound. Cage's offering of silence is an anathema to the composer's art. But Wolfgang, you miss the essence of innovation. To push beyond the boundaries, to explore what lies in the void of silence, that's where true genius lies. Cage challenges us, not to find music where there is none, but to listen deeply to the world. To hear music in the mundane is the mark of a true master. And yet, where do we draw the line, Ludwig? Must we not have a discerning ear to distinguish between noise and music, chaos and harmony? Indeed, the crux of the matter lies in perception. 433 is not an absence of music, but an invitation to perceive differently. It is a composition as complex as any opera or symphony, for it composes the listener's awareness itself. Thus, perhaps the question is not where music ends and ambient sound begins, but how we choose to listen. Cage's silence is a canvas, not blank, but primed for the listener to paint with their own perceptions and reflections. True, Johann. 
Yet, can we call it composition if it lacks intent from the composer, relying solely on the listener's interpretation of silence? Isn't the intent clear, though? Cage intended to blur the lines, to make us question and to listen. In that, he has composed not just a piece of music, but a moment of philosophy. As our heated debate demonstrates, the boundary between music and ambient sound is as much about personal definition as it is about philosophical inquiry. Cage's 433 remains a provocative landmark in this exploration, as relevant today as at its premiere. Let us dive into the matter of how environment and context shape our experiences of music, and how this evolution of thought led Cage to conceive something as radical as 433. Johan, your sacred compositions often played in voluminous cathedrals. How do you perceive this setting affecting the silence and sound within your works? In spaces divine, where echoes fill the air like the breath of God, silence becomes a profound utterance. My compositions, whether it be the mass in B minor or the well-tempered clavier, seek to bridge earth to the heavens. In such a context, silence is not merely the absence of sound. It is a canvas for the soul's reflection, a pause between the whispers of the divine. Ah, but Johann, in the theater, it's the dance of silence and sound that captivates. Silence in my operas, say in the pause before the Queen of the Night's high F in Die Zauberflöte, that silence teems with anticipation. But I must say, the setting of a court or a public theater transforms these moments of silence dramatically. In the court, it's a respectful hush. In the public theater, it's a breathless shared anticipation. How wildly different these contexts play upon the very same stretch of silence. Yet what of our internal landscapes, the cities and countrysides of our minds? In my late quartets, I explored silences as profound as any thunderous fortissimo. As my hearing dimmed, the line between silence and sound blurred, and I discovered vast landscapes within. Whether in Vienna's music halls or the pastoral tranquility of my Heiligenstadt testament, the context in which music and silence are perceived shifts profoundly. Johann Wolfgang, your contexts are external. Mine became unavoidably internal. And what of the drama of the opera? My La Traviata, Rigoletto, the silence within these works, laden with emotion and tension, becomes a character unto itself. But let us not overlook the audience, the receiver of our art. In the opera house, amidst the velvet and gilt, the silence shared by hundreds breathes life into the music. Silence amplifies the drama, each pause a heart beating in anticipation. Silence in music, irrespective of era or genre, is the shadow to sound's light, essential and defining. Ah, but here we stand, debating the role of silence in our varied contexts. Yet what Cage questioned was the essence of these very sounds and silences we cherish. He stripped away the church, the theater, the opera house, even the internal musings, and left us with the ambient sounds of life itself. Is it not then a provocative thought that the context Cage offers is in essence every context? Provocative indeed, Igor. Yet as one who found the deepest expression in the delicate dance between sound and silence, I wonder, does not the emotion evoked by music or by its absence transcend the environment? In the tender caress of a nocturne or the introspective pause within a prelude, the heart finds its resonance. Cage, in leaving us with silence, asks us to find music not just in the notes but in the very air we breathe, irrespective of the walls that surround us or the era we inhabit. Precisely, Frederick. Cage's 433 challenges us to hear the world anew, to acknowledge the music inherent in the ambient noise of life, the context of the universe itself. It is here in this discussion where we find our perceptions of music, of silence and of sound are both deeply personal and universally shared, shaped by context, yes, but also shaping our very understanding of what music can be. Their conversation, a tumultuous sea of differing opinions and shared insights, reveals the complexity of music's relationship with silence, environment and context, a testament to not only their genius, but also the enduring capacity of music to evolve and challenge. Let us delve into the minimalist essence, a topic that John Cage with his 433 without doubt casts in stark relief. The question to be pondered, 
Does the minimalist approach, including the use of silence, truly evolve the musical composition? Or do we lose the emotional complexity and narrative depth that music can convey? Ah, minimalism, you see, it is much like the sparest of brushstrokes on a canvas. In my compositions, a single note often carries the weight of a thousand emotions. Silence, too, can be profound, laden with expectation and resolve. It is not the abundance of notes, but their relation and the tension between them that crafts the depth of emotion. Silence and minimalism, they are but tools in this endeavor, not limitations. Indeed, Frederick, I concur that silence and minimal notes can carry codas of depth. But let us not forget, the intricacy of a fugue, the divine mathematics weaving through its measure, speaks to a complexity of thought, emotion, and spirituality that minimalism oft skirts. The balance is paramount. Minimalism, for its own sake, risks emptiness. Gentlemen, let us not beat around the bush. Drama and emotion dwell in the heart of opera, and it is through the swell of the orchestra, the crescendo of voices, that this drama unfolds. Minimalism, silence, these can punctuate, yes, but the narrative, the opera's soul, demands the richness of full composition. To rely solely on minimalism to make silence the crux of a piece is akin to telling a story without words. Intriguing, but ultimately, incomplete. Bah! You speak of minimalism as if it were a disease. Have you forgotten the power of a single sustained note, the anticipation before a resolution, the space between notes, the silence? It is nothing less than the breath between the beats of the heart. It is dynamic. It lives. My late quartets, they flirt with these ideas, challenging the listener, demanding active engagement. The emotion, the narrative, it is not lost. It is distilled. You four dance around the hearth of our discussion. Yes, narratives and emotions are complex, but think, does not simplicity have its own complexity? Cages 433 is a mirror to the listener, a composition turned inside out. The minimalism here, it is not a reduction, but an expansion. It challenges the preconceptions, asking what is music, what is sound, what is silence? A mirror, yes, Igor, but where is the line? At what point does the push towards minimalism and silence cease to expand and instead begin to remove too much, leaving us barren? The foundation, it matters. One cannot dismiss centuries of harmonic development and structural integrity for the sake of experiment. Yet, I acknowledge, within strict confines, creativity flourishes. Perhaps, then, there is more to explore in this minimalism than I have given credit. Ha! Johan, you surprise me bending so easily. Do not dismiss the grandeur and the lushness of our art for fleeting experiments. Giuseppe, open your ears and your mind. It is not the dismissal of complexity, but the exploration of a new dimension. Silence and minimalism, they force us to listen, truly listen. Our heated debate serves to illuminate the vast expanse of musical expression, from the intricate fugues of Bach to the silent reflection proposed by Cage. This discussion, it reveals not just our opinions on minimalism, but the very nature of music itself, an art form perpetually pushing its own boundaries. Now, we delve into the intriguing interplay between audience expectations and compositional innovation. How do we balance the taste of the time with the push for new boundaries? Ah, the eternal dance between pleasing and provoking. I've always believed in charming the audience, seducing them with a familiar tune, then, when they least expect it, challenging their ears with something utterly new. A fine composition should be like a good jest, unexpected yet deeply satisfying. Wolfgang, your approach lacks the courage to truly challenge the status quo. We cannot merely coax the audience along with sweet melodies. No, we must lead them, forcefully if need be, into new territories. I did not write my symphonies to cater to the whims of my time, but to forge a path for music. Both of you dance around the issue. Opera teaches us that the audience craves drama, emotional peaks, and valleys. Yet, when we weave these into novel compositions, we often face resistance, not because the audience cannot grasp it, but because they are unprepared. The fault lies not in our compositions, but in our failure to prepare the audience for the journey ahead. And yet, Giuseppe, True innovation in music, much like poetry, whispers before it shouts. Emotional depth is not won through mere drama, but through the subtle interplay of expectation and surprise. Our task is to guide the listener's heart, not to drag it through our own tumultuous journey. 
Gentlemen, your spirited debate orbits around the core truth that music, in essence, is communication. Whether through the structured purity of a fugue or the passionate cry of an opera, our compositions must speak to the soul. Ignoring the listener's capacity to understand and feel is as foolhardy as ignoring the rules of harmony and counterpoint. An invigorating mosaic of perspectives. Yet it seems we are circling the question of responsibility. Do we, as composers, owe our allegiance to the craft and its future, or to those who lend us their ears? The answer is clear. Our first duty is to the evolution of music itself. Without daring to explore and expand, we risk stagnation. We must challenge the listener, even at the cost of present misunderstanding, for the sake of future enlightenment. Ludwig, your noble ideals speak of sacrifice, but music also exists for joy and celebration. If our innovations alienate those we seek to enchant, what then? Is our lofty future built on the silence of empty concert halls? Enough, both of you. The true art lies in marrying the innovative with the familiar, ensuring our art evolves without losing its audience. We must navigate these waters with care, for a composer without an audience is a voice lost to the wind. Indeed, Giuseppe. And let us not forget, each listener's ear is as unique as the composer's voice. We do not write for an abstract audience, but for living, breathing beings, each with their own capacity for understanding and emotion. A spirited debate, indeed. It would seem the balance between innovation and tradition is as delicate as the interplay between silence and sound. Let us carry these thoughts with us as we move to our next topic. Let us delve into a profound and often contentious aspect of music, defining its very essence. Does a musical composition require sound, or can silence carry as much weight? Yuhan, your works are deeply rooted in spirituality. Can silence elevate the soul as sound does? Indeed, silence and sound are both servants to the divine truth in music. Consider the rests in a fugue, not mere absences of sound, but rather spaces where the soul breathes. A composition devoid of notes, to my mind, lacks the very essence of music. For music is a conversation with the divine, and can silence alone articulate such a dialogue? Ah, Johann, but does not silence evoke emotion as profoundly as sound? In my nocturnes, the pauses are as expressive as the notes themselves, drawing the listener into a deeper introspection. Perhaps music, then, is not just sound or silence, but the emotion it stirs within us. Frederick, while your sentiment touches upon truth, you oversimplify. Music's power lies in its dialectic between sound and silence. Without one, the other loses meaning. My symphonies exploit this tension, navigating between roaring crescendos and the most delicate pauses. Silence thus is not music itself, but the shadow it casts, giving form and depth to sound. But we are composers, are we not? Creators of sound. How can we then say a piece without a single note played, like Cage's silent spectacle, is music? It is an affront, a charade. Opera, my domain, thrives on melody, harmony, and drama. Silence may frame a moment, give it tension or release, but it is the voice, the orchestra, sound, that breathes life into the story. Gentlemen, gentlemen, might we be too hasty to judge? Music is an art of emotion, and silence in its own right can speak volumes. Think of the rests in my serenades, a momentary pause can create anticipation, longing, fear, delight. Perhaps what Cage seeks to illuminate is not the absence of music, but a canvas for the listener's own internal symphony. As a foil to our historically based perspectives, I propose considering the evolution of music as a constant quest for expression in whatever form it may manifest. The rupture between sound and silence in Cage's 433 poses not a negation, but an expansion of the musical lexicon we stand not at the edge of music's demise, but at the vista of infinite possibilities. A daring proposition, Igor, but let us not conflate novelty with profundity. Music has boundaries, as do all arts. To claim otherwise is to misunderstand its nature. And yet, Johann, without pushing these boundaries, would we not still be composing Gregorian chants? Art evolves, and with it, our understanding. Evolution, Frederick, does not necessitate the abandonment of all tradition. There must be a symbiosis, a bridge that connects the past with the future. Hmm. And what future do we behold if we are to consider silence as music? 
Will our concert halls be filled with audiences sitting in quietude, applauding the absence of effort? Perhaps, Giuseppe, it is not the absence of effort we should focus on, but the presence of reflection. In our hustle to fill every moment with sound, have we forgotten the beauty of contemplation, of listening to the world around us, and indeed to ourselves? A passionate debate, gentlemen, reflecting the diverse tapestry of thought among us. Whether through sound, silence, or the interplay between, it is clear music's ultimate endeavor is to touch the human spirit, to communicate that which words cannot. Let us then embrace the myriad forms this communication might take as we continue to explore the vast expanse of musical expression. Let us now delve into the heart of the matter. Where lies the responsibility in the crafting of music with the composer the performer, or perhaps both. 433, a composition void of intentional sound, throws a stark light upon this debate. Ha! This notion that a piece such as 433 could unsettle the profound covenant between composer and performer is absurdity embodied. In my symphonies, in each note writ, there is intent, an emotive force that the performer must seize and convey. Silence or sound, the composer's will is paramount. Ludwig, ever the titan clashing with titans, but consider, the dialogue between composer and performer, it's akin to a spirited dance, a collaboration. Yes, the composer sketches the blueprint, but without the performer's breath, the notes, silent or sounded, languish lifeless. Both of you so entangled in your convictions. The performer breathes life into our etchings indeed, but without our initial spark, what is there? The opera stage, my domain, thrives on this symbiosis. Yet, the essence originates from the composer's quill. Without our narrative, there is naught but empty air and idle instruments. A moment, please. This debate, it veers close to missing the silent question posed by Cage. Isn't the true query not of dominance, but of possibility? In a piece composed of silence or the ambient noise of life, is the composer not offering the ultimate canvas to the performer? A space not confined by notes, but limitless in potential? You all meander around the subject. The composer lays down the law as God lays down the laws of nature. The performer, much like mankind, interprets these laws, sometimes bending them, but the foundation remains unshaked. Cage's silence, it is but another law, a pause between notes extending ad infinitum. Yet the framework is composed, dictated. Interesting. Johann brings us back, spiraling to the core. The contention, the vigor, it peaks not in disagreement, but in the unfolding of myriad truths. Each composition, silent or thunderous, is a universe. The performer, a traveler navigating this realm, sometimes discovering new galaxies within the penned constellations of the composer. Cages 433, then, is it not the canvas and the cosmos? It urges performer and audience alike to listen to the unscripted symphony that surrounds us. Cosmos or not, the canvas is blank without the stroke of the composer's pen. Silence, sound, it matters little. Without direction, there is chaos, not art. Yet consider the intimacy of a single note played after silence, or the emotion evoked by the pause in a nocturne. This interaction, it's delicate, profound. Cage merely extends this pause, inviting reflection, introspection. Mayhaps the truth lies in the heart of the performance, the moment when composer's intent and performer's interpretation collide and coalesce. Silence, like sound, can stir the soul, but it is the human touch be it on keys or strings or breath that awakens the music within the silence. Enough. We chase ourselves in circles. Whether through notes or silence, it is the fire of creation, the composer's vision, which ignites. The performer then fans this flame or smothers it with incompetence. So we find ourselves navigating the vast, boundless sea between creation and interpretation. Our musings on Cages 433 underscore not a conflict, but a confluence the immutable bond between composer and performer, each indispensable to the art of music. Silence and sound in their dance reveal the essence of musicality, an unending dialogue across ages, a dialogue that embraces every pause, every note, woven into the continuum of creation. Let us delve into the tumultuous waters of history, what currents, do you suppose, carried us to the shores of such a composition as 433? I, to grasp 433, one must first understand the operatic crescendo of innovation. 
In my operas, every silence served as the shadow to sound, heightening the drama. But Cage, Cage turned the shadow into the spectacle. Indeed, the lineage of music betrays a continuous march towards complexity and simultaneously simplicity. My fugues labyrinthine in their structure, yet within them, the silence is as crucial as any note played. It is this understanding of silence as music's counterpart that paved the path for Cage's silence to take center stage. Bah, this talk of lineage. Cage's work is an abolishment of all that came before. Where I fought to infuse silence with the power of a storm, he has mistaken emptiness for profundity. Music is emotion, struggle, triumph, not the idle open-mouthed gawking at an empty stage. My dear Ludwig, you mistake the forest for the trees. Is not the anticipation between my phrases, the breath before the finale, not akin to Cage's proposition? His work merely strips away the facade, leaving the raw, unadorned essence of expectation. Yet there is poetry in this emptiness, a canvas upon which the mind can wander unrestrained. In my nocturnes, the notes themselves reach out to the silence, seeking to embrace it. Cage, in his daring, has made the silence reach back. And so, we find ourselves at an impasse of understanding. Is there then no consensus among us on the value of this silence? Value? A tempest in a teapot. Music demands melody, harmony, rhythm. Cage offers none of these, serving instead a platter of silence and calling it a feast. Giuseppe, you miss the forest for the trees. The feast lies not in the silence itself, but in the listening. Cage invites the world to listen, to truly hear. That is the innovation, the breaking of chains that bound our compositions. Listening to what? The creak of a chair? the cough of an ill-mannered audience member. If this is music, then my deafness has made me a virtuoso of this new music long before Cage's birth. Come now, we have all toyed with the edges of silence, danced around the void. Cage merely took the step we did not. Whether folly or genius, he leaped into silence with both feet and found it not empty, but brimming with the unplayed music of life itself. Life's music. Indeed, there is a melancholy beauty to it. Perhaps then, in this context, 433 is not a negation of music, but an expansion. It challenges the listener to find music in the mundane, a concept both revolutionary and as old as the hills. A fitting paradox that Cage's composition, by relying on the absence of intention, invites a plethora of interpretations. Whether we deem it profound or vacuous, it undeniably alters the landscape of musical thought, as any significant work must. Let us plunge into the inevitable future that Cage's silence hints at. What vistas do we see opening in the realm of avant-garde and experimental music? Cage's silence is but the starting point. Future compositions must challenge us further, tearing apart the very fabric of what we consider music. Think of Beethoven's Gross Affuge. It was reviled, misunderstood, yet it pushed boundaries. We need compositions that dismantle traditional structures, embracing chaos, disorder. But must we always seek to dismantle? Bach found innovation within structure, within the disciplined counterpoint. Innovations need not always demolish. They can build, intertwining tradition and novelty. Yet there is something deeply unsettling about this future spectrum of music. Cage liberated music from sound itself, but at what cost? There's a danger in severing the emotional tether between music and its listener. Without the soul's resonance, what remains? The future shall hold a synthesis, perhaps. Imagine a canvas where silence and sound, the traditional and the avant-garde, dance in unity. There is much to be explored in the nuances, in the interplay of expectations and reality. But let us not forget the drama, the narrative. Verdi's operas thrive on these elements. Can avant-garde music sustain such? It must, else it risks becoming an intellectual exercise devoid of the heart, devoid of the human story. The future, as I see it, rests not solely in composition, but in perception. The blurring lines between noise, silence, and sound invite us to reconsider not just how we create, but how we listen. The avant-garde movement, thus, is as much about educating the ear as it is about pioneering new sonic landscapes. True, but let it not become an excuse for mediocrity. Just as a well-composed symphony demands virtuosity and depth, so too should experimental works demand profundity not just novelty for novelty's sake. And in this rush towards the future, let us not abandon the essence that stirs the soul. Music, irrespective of its form, must continue to inspire,
to evoke that which words cannot capture. Therein lies the challenge for the future composer, to innovate within or without traditions, but always to elevate, to touch the divine spark through whatever medium we channel. All said and done, the landscape appears fraught with dualities, sound and silence, tradition and innovation, emotion and intellectualism. But isn't it this very tension that propels music forward into realms yet uncharted but rich with potential? Indeed, and may we never lose sight of the narrative of the human element in our quest for innovation. It is, after all, the reflection of our stories, our struggles, our joys, that imbues music with its timeless power. As the future unfolds, so too will the definition of music expand, challenge, and redefine itself in perpetual motion. The avant-garde, then, is not an endpoint, but a continual journey towards understanding the limitless expressions of the human condition through sound, silence, and beyond. Today, we delve into the educational values and methods of introducing avant-garde compositions, such as John Cage's 433, to the newer generations. Ludwig, your approach has always been fundamentally rigorous. How does one teach the importance of silence in music? Silence, you see, is as vital as the notes themselves. It creates a canvas upon which emotions can be painted. In Moonlight Sonata, the silence between movements is not empty. It's charged with anticipation. Educating the young minds, we must stress that silence is not absence, but an integral part of musical texture. Cage's 433 pushes this to the forefront, challenging them to listen to what is not immediately evident. I cannot help but express skepticism. While I concede, Ludwig, your point on silence holds merit, but to present Cage's composition as a pillar of musical education undermines the foundation of melody and harmony. We must tread carefully lest we lead the youth into an abyss where music loses its essence. Teach them Verdi, teach them the power of arias that stir the soul. Let not Cage's silence deafen them to the voices of the past. Ah, but Giuseppe, there is room for both the voice of the past and the silence of the future in our teachings. The delicate touch of a nocturne, where silence speaks as loudly as a cascading arpeggio, is proof that music thrives on contrast. Cage's work is a radical embodiment of this contrast, pushing the boundaries of what we perceive as music. Embracing such compositions in education broadens the student's understanding and appreciation of music's vast landscape. The point, however, is not to diverge entirely into the realm of the avant-garde at the cost of foundational musical principles. In Bach's fugues, silence marks the entrance of the subject, a guide through complex contrapuntal structures. Education should mirror this balance, where traditional composition and experimental ideas coalesce. Only then can we truly prepare them for both the preservation and evolution of the musical art form. Yet, must we not also consider the engagement of these young minds with music that challenges their perception? Surely a composition like 433 ignites curiosity, incites debate, it forces them to listen, to the world, to themselves. My operas, the space between notes, the unresolved tension, it's designed to elicit emotion, compel introspection. Perhaps then Cage is not displacing melody, but complementing it, fostering a holistic musical awareness in students. The passion in this discussion underlines the complexity of our task as educators and innovators. We confront the challenge of blending tradition with exploration, ensuring the essence of music its ability to convey the inexpressible remains intact as we usher in new forms and ideas. Our responsibility is to guide, to illuminate the path from Bach to Cage, showing that music is a living, breathing entity, always evolving, yet eternally rooted in the foundational truths we hold dear. Well said, Igor. We must equip the new generation with the understanding that music is a reflection of life itself, ever-changing, full of contrasts and enriched by diversity. Whether through the intricate dance of melodies or the profound silence of 433, the ultimate lesson is to listen deeply and attentively. And yet, let us not forsake the masters in pursuit of novelty. Remember, it is upon their shoulders we stand, gazing into the unknown. Their melodies and harmonies have traversed centuries, touching hearts and inspiring minds. This legacy is our gift to the future, even as we explore the silence that Cage presents. Indeed, the dual inheritance of tradition and innovation is our greatest strength. 
Let us wield it with wisdom and courage, challenging our students to not only inherit the past, but to dare to define the future of music in all its forms and silences. Let us now distill our thoughts, our spirited discussions, into final reflections on Cages 433. Wolfgang, would you start? Indeed, 433 challenges the very essence of what we call music. In my operas, silence was as much a part of the narrative as the arias. But to compose a piece that is entirely silent? That's audacious, ingenious, yet it leaves me perplexed. It calls into question the role of the composer. Are we not to manipulate sound to express the inexpressible? Ah, Wolfgang, always the charmer, even in disagreement. For me, Cage's silence is deafening. In my late works, when my hearing had all but forsaken me, silence became my canvas. Yet even in silence I heard the roar of Beethoven. 433 is not music, it's philosophy, a challenge that asks if there's music in the silence within us, and yet it lacks the soul's struggle against fate. Where is the passion, the victory? You speak of passion, Ludwig, but what of the drama in the unplayed notes? I admit, I find 433 unsettling. In my operas, silence serves the drama, heightens anticipation. Cage strips even that away, leaving what? An emptiness that cannot be filled with pomp or piety. And yet, I cannot dismiss it outright. It forces us to listen to the world anew. But is it music? I dare say not. Gentlemen, I find your resistance fascinating. Cage, in his quiet rebellion, has done what we all sought in our own ways. He has transcended the traditional bounds of composition. In the delicate dances of my nocturnes, silence speaks as eloquently as sound. 433 is the ultimate expression of this principle. It invites introspection, a meditation. It connects the audience to the music of existence itself. There is profound emotion in that connection, something I believe is worth exploring. Your words carry weight, Frederic, yet they dance around the core of our craft. The architecture of music is built on harmony, melody, counterpoint, elements absent from 433. My fugues and cantatas were designed to elevate the spirit, to reflect divine order through sound. Cage's silence is the antithesis of this, a reflection of chaos, not order. It strips music of its divine connection. Is the sound of life music? Perhaps, but it lacks intention, composition. And so we find ourselves at an impasse, each holding true to our convictions. Cage's 433 has sparked more debate among us than I had anticipated. It challenges us to reconsider the boundaries of what music can be, pushing against centuries of tradition and expectation. In a way, it mirrors the avant-garde movements across all art forms, questioning, probing, unsettling. Whether one considers it music or not, it undeniably prompts a profound reflection on the essence of sound, silence, and the spaces between. Our disagreement, heated though it may be, underscores the piece's enduring relevance and its capacity to provoke debate. Thank you, gentlemen, for a most invigorating discussion.